And welcome to the One God Report podcast. This is Bill Schlegel. The episode today is, Is John Chapter 1 Evidence That God Is a Trinity? I'm going to take a look at James White's book, The Forgotten Trinity, where he will pretty much immediately go to John Chapter 1, which for him is evidence that the God of the Scriptures is a trinity. And uh, if you're not familiar with this book, listen to James White on videos these days. You don't have to buy a book if you don't want to, but you can buy his book, take a look, and read it and see if you think he is giving conclusive proof that the God of the Scriptures, the God of the Bible, is triune, three persons in one being. I don't think he is. When I read this book, I say, whoa, really? This is the evidence? Now, if you don't think James White is a good representative of making a case for the Trinity, well, he has some pretty glowing recommendations on the back of his book. Uh, If you haven't listened to podcast number 72, Is the Trinity in the Bible? If so, where? Take a look at that one, where I also talk a little bit about James White's book. But here, here's Norman Geisler, Christian apologist and author of a book called Systematic Theology. He says, quote, No doctrine is more fundamental to the faith than the Trinity, and there is no more brief, clear, biblical, and practical explanation of the Trinity than in these pages, unquote. That's Geisler's recommendation for James White's book. So here, there's no more brief, clear, biblical, and practical explanation of the Trinity than in these pages of James White's book. Forget the Bible, apparently, forgot about that. As a conservative Christian, I would hope that the best explanation, the clearest explanation about God being triune would be in the Bible and not in James White's book. But, you know, sometimes these guys are just trying to be nice and they exaggerate in their recommendations of a book for somebody. But in my experience, so many Christians seem to think that John chapter 1 is like the best evidence that Jesus is God and then therefore somehow God is a trinity. And so does James White, obviously, because this is really the first biblical passage that he will bring forth in his book to describe that God is a trinity. Remember, the the title of the book is not Jesus is God or something like that. It's the forgotten trinity. He wants to bring biblical evidence that God is triune. So after introductory chapters and describing what he thinks the trinity is, this chapter, or chapter four in his book, he titled it A Masterpiece, The Prologue of John. Now, I I agree that the prologue of the Gospel of John is a masterpiece. I mean, here we are thousands of years later, and we're still discussing the prologue of the Gospel of John. And I think it's very important that we understand the prologue of the Gospel of John correctly, because if we don't, we miss out on what he's really explaining. But it's strange, if you are Trinitarian, that the main passage that you think is important for believing that God is a trinity is John chapter 1. James White says in his book here, page 44, he says, Few passages of Scripture are more important to our study for the trinity, and in particular of the person of the Son, than the prologue of John. Again, the very fact that he brings this chapter first in his book to try and show that God is a trinity, for him, this is like your main Boom. This is where we're going to open up the Bible and show God is a trinity. So to start off, I, as a conservative believer who really thinks the Bible is the word of God, and that all throughout Israel's testimony, the God who created the heavens and the earth, the God who formed Israel from Abraham, the God who brought Israel out of Egypt, who said, I am Yahweh, yud your God. There is no other. And this God that is referred to thousands and thousands of times with singular personal pronouns, I, me, he, him. And now we're going to come to the 43rd book in the Protestant Christian canon, the 43rd book. And we're going to learn that God is three persons. Now, if that's the case, it better be very, very clear. If it's not, then maybe what we're interpreting as evidence that God is more than one person. There might be a better way to interpret the beginning of this 43rd book of the Protestant canon. Now, in the prologue of John's gospel, God is not a trinity. I'll say that again. In the prologue of John's gospel, 
The word God, the title God, is not a trinity. Even James White would say that. So this is supposed to be the best chapter that describes that God is triune, three persons in one. And yet God in this chapter is not triune. Hold on. Something's wrong. Now, I agree with James White that John chapter 1 is a literary masterpiece. But we better get this right. And like he says, if we don't get this part right, we're going to misunderstand the rest of John's gospel. So let's get this right. And I agree with what James White says on page 44, that John chapter 1 yields, quote, tremendous insights into the heart of God's revelation of himself in Jesus Christ. Now, James, hold on a second. You have just got done saying in your definition that God is three persons. If God is triune, then God is not revealing himself. God is revealing themselves. Otherwise, you have a one self God. You see your statement there on page 44, at the very least, is modalism. If God is himself, you have a one self God. Now, another thing that I agree upon with James is that we do need to look at the original language because sometimes the translations are going to be biased. And if you don't know Greek, I don't know Greek that well, but I know it well enough that I can look things up and compare. But even if you don't know Greek, you can at least see how there might be something a little bit different there because English translations have translated something differently. For instance, John 1.14, the King James Version says, and the word was made flesh. But other translations say, and the word became flesh. So that should be a red flag. Hold on. What's that word there? If the King James is translating as was made, but somebody else translates the same word as became. So it is important to look at the Greek here. But one little warning, being able to read the Greek doesn't solve all the issues. It's actually kind of funny to read articles and commentaries by people who know the Greek and then see how they disagree with each other and how they make the issues even more complicated. I'll post an article in the show notes as an example. I'm going to follow along in his chapter and just respond to some of the things he says. If I forget to say the page numbers, this chapter starts on page 43 and goes to page 61. So he's going to look at John chapter 1 word by word, which is, I think that's good. And he starts by looking at in the beginning. Listen to what James White says. I mean, when I first read this, I was said, exactly. Here's what James White says about in the beginning. John chapter 1 starts out, in the beginning was the word. So he's going to look at the word beginning. Here's James White, page 45, quote, Just as Genesis introduces God's work of creation, so John 1.1 1, 1 introduces God's work of redeeming that people. And that work has been going on just as long as creation itself, unquote. James, that's it. You've got it. Keep going with that thought. Which beginning is John talking about? Yes, could he intentionally be echoing the Genesis creation? But just as you recognize, and like many other Trinitarian scholars recognize, John chapter 1 is about a new beginning. Just like you say here, it's God's work of redemption of that people. So if we get this beginning wrong, and then we interpret John chapter 1 as dealing with the Genesis creation, we might be barking up the wrong tree. Listen to what you just said and to what other Trinitarian scholars say, that John chapter 1, yes, intentionally parallels Genesis chapter 1, but he's introducing the new beginning of God's work in the man Jesus Christ. Wow, now we are hunting at the correct tree. Otherwise, if we're going to interpret this beginning wrong, we are barking up the wrong tree. So this is very important. Actually, in both Genesis and in John chapter 1, the definite article, the, is not really in the phrase, in the beginning. It really technically is in a beginning. That might help people to understand that, hey, maybe this is a new beginning, just like other Trinitarian scholars recognize. Let me quote one other Trinitarian scholar to show that they recognize that John is talking about a new beginning in Jesus, not the Genesis creation. 
Here's a quote from respected Trinitarian biblical commentator F.F. F. Bruce from his commentary called The Gospel of John, a verse-by-verse verse exposition. Bruce said, quote, It is not by accident that the gospel begins with the same phrase as the book of Genesis. In Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, introduces the story of the old creation. Here, it introduces the story of the new creation. Unquote. So let's get this right. John chapter 1 verse 1 is introducing the story of the new creation that God brings about through the man Jesus Christ, who's called the Word in this chapter. And I agree with James White. He talks then about what this word means, logos, and how this is a person. But here's the difference. Is this person present at the Genesis creation? Or is he present at the new creation that God brings about in the first century? That's the difference. We have to get rid of Greek ideas of logos being a plan or a pattern or even a thought or an intention or a second divine figure who, although subordinate to the one true God, was involved in the Genesis creation. For the Hebrew biblical mind, the word of God is how God brings about and does things. And that's why Jesus, the man Jesus, is called the Word here in the Gospel of John, chapter 1. And then James takes quite a bit of time on the word was. In the beginning, was the Word. And I think he's wrong here. He thinks that the Greek tense of this verb means that the Word was from everlasting and everlasting. But it simply means that whatever beginning we're talking about, the Word was there. So, if we're talking about the new beginning that God brings about through Jesus, Jesus is there. It depends on what beginning is being referenced. So all of his talk here about this was being evidence that Jesus is eternal, it's wrong. It misses the mark. And the word was with God. Now here he also recognizes correctly that this suggests a personal relationship. And I agree with him. And I believe that the man, Jesus Christ, was uniquely with God in the beginning, just like Moses was with God. At the beginning of God's redemption of Israel from Egypt. And then the phrase and the word was God. See, Trinitarians have a problem here because they can't say that Jesus is the Trinity, right? Remember, the word God here does not mean the Trinity, even though this is supposed to be the chapter which is telling us that God is a Trinity. And they also can't say that the word was God means that the word was the Father. And also the fact that the definite article, which often is in the Greek title for God, ha, theos, the ha, is the definite article, the. So many times in the Greek, God has the definite article. It's not in this second appearance of the word God in John chapter 1. This is why there's all this back and forth with the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Aryan type people that think that Jesus was a God, right? He's some kind of a lesser God. And there's all this discussion back and forth. I think that God here is the Father. The, the word was God is not an ontological statement. John is not making a declaration about the God nature or the being, the divinity of Jesus. Rather, it's a statement about representation. God at work in the word the man Jesus was God's word, and therefore this is God at work. In this gospel, Jesus said, When you see me, you see the Father. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. It's the Father at work in me. So this is what John is saying in this first sentence. So there's no need, like the Trinitarians and the Jehovah's Witnesses do, to change the meaning of the word God between John 1.1b 1, 1, and the word was with God, and then John 1.1c, 1, 1, and the word was God. The Trinitarians and the Arians, they have to change the meaning of the word God. I think that this is the Father, and Jesus was God because he's representing God. This is God at work in and through Jesus. This is not a statement like James White wants to claim about the nature, about his ontological being or something like that, that now we have a second God or a second person who's God in being or in nature. 
And on page 52, you see the Trinitarian scholars, they have to say that this word God here doesn't really mean God. It means something like deity, because they recognize that he's not really saying that Jesus is the same God that we just learned about in the previous phrase. He's got to be somehow different. It's only that Jesus is deity. That's what it comes down to for them. The average Christian on the street doesn't realize this, but the scholars tend to want to take this as a quality, that he's deity. Interesting that James White quotes F.F. F. Bruce, who also somehow takes this as a declaration of Jesus sharing the nature, ontologically he's God. But then Bruce also puts this little piece in here. He says that the word was an extension of the personality of God, unquote. That's on page 51 of White's book. Now, hold on a second. To be an extension of the personality of God is something very different from being ontologically in being God. And I would agree with Bruce's statement that, yes, Jesus was an extension of the personality of God. Again, he's getting close to understanding that Jesus represents God because he's God's word. He's God at work. So just briefly again, Trinitarians and Arians have to take a meaning of the word God here that is different than the way the word God normally is used in the rest of the Gospel of John, in the rest of the New Testament. This Greek word theos, God, it means the Father. In the places where they think Jesus is being called God, it's not really he's being called God, he's being called deity. It's the abstract nature. It's not that he's God, he's deity. So it's a different use of this Greek word theos. Then on page 55, James moves into verses 2 and 3, where he says that Jesus is the eternal word, the creator. Now, if you look through John chapter 1, you're never going to find the word for create. It's not there. You may find it in some English translations, but again, it's not in the Greek. The word create is not there. The word here is came to be. This is the word that is often translated as was made or was created. So again, we have a translation issue. But one of the big things that James does wrong here, he, he cheats a bit, because in verse 3, they translate the word through as by. You'll use a translation that says something like, all things were created by him, but the word is not by. The word is through. It's the normal word for through. And we can see in other translations that things are coming to be through the word, right? So the word here is not the original creator, is not the original source of creation. He's the channel, or he's participating in this creation, whichever it is. If it's the Genesis creation, or if it's the new creation of life in Jesus. And it makes sense that the Word is not the creator. The Word was God's instrument in creating. And it's the same here in the new creation through Jesus. Things, especially its life, that comes to be through Jesus, through him. So that's just not fair. Again, it's another place, if you don't know Greek, you can look at some of the English translations and say, hold on a second. The ESV says all things were made through him, but other translations like the New American Standard says all things came into being by him. Which is it? Is it by? Is he the original source? Or was he participating but someone else is the original source. Now, if you're going to say that Jesus is the original source, you are denigrating God the Father. So be careful. If in the 43rd book of the Protestant canon, you interpret one phrase to say that God the Father is not the creator, it might be worthwhile to rethink your interpretation. As a Trinitarian, see, I was doing the same thing. I was taking passages like John 1 or Colossians 1 or Hebrews 1 and thinking that somehow Jesus was the creator or involved in creating in Genesis chapter 1, but I didn't understand about the new creation that God brings about through the man Christ Jesus. Read these passages in that context and all of a sudden, boom, wow, things open up. And you see the work of God in Christ Jesus, in the man, Christ Jesus. 
And again, here's evidence that John 1 is not about the Genesis creation. I'd like to ask, in the Genesis creation, what came first, light or life? The answer is light. God said, let there be light first, and there was light. Life comes later on. But in the Gospel of John, life is first. You see, it's life that is the focus of the Gospel of John. It's the creation of new life. This gospel is about the resurrection of a man from the dead. This is the new creation of life. In him was life, John chapter 1, 3 and 4 says. And the life was the light of men. You see, in John, life is first and then light. John is appropriating creation type language, but he's talking about a different creation than the book of Genesis. Now, the next thing James does is he skips over a lot of John chapter 1. He doesn't give a, not even a paragraph to the ministry of John the Baptist in verses 6 through 8. Because honestly, John the Baptist has no business being so early and prominently in an account of the Genesis creation. So it doesn't fit his theory, so he really just skips over it. But it makes perfect sense that John the Baptist is introduced so early in John's prologue if we're talking about the new beginning in the man, the Messiah, Jesus from Nazareth. So then James skips down to verse 14, and he calls it, Eternity invades time. And he talks about how the Logos, the Word, was not eternally flesh, right? Quoting him, page 56, He existed in a non-fleshy manner in eternity past. And then he says, the eternal experienced time. So now the Trinity has changed. The Trinity formerly was not flesh, and now the Trinity, even if you say just one member of the Trinity became flesh, the Trinity became flesh. So James is driven to say things like this, that the word, the creator of all things, where's the Father, excuse me, but this is what James White says, the creator of all things, the eternal one. Where's the Father, James? Please. If Jesus, the Word, is the eternal one, is not the Father eternal? He says the eternal one became flesh. James says that this is just a real mystery and that John doesn't tell us the mechanics of how this happened. Well, that's a problem because if this really happened, that God became flesh, this is the most important event that ever was, greater than the resurrection. The resurrection would pale in comparison to this. But the Gospel of John doesn't describe the conception or birth. Not a word about it. That's really strange. If we want to interpret John 1.14, the word became flesh as an incarnation of the eternal God into a human being, and there's no description of that, hmm, maybe we're not interpreting it right. And then James, to me, makes a big mistake here. On page 57, because he has defined for us that the Trinity is three persons in one being. One being. That's how we can say that God is one. He's one being. But then he says that, quote, Jesus was not simply some phantom or spirit masquerading as a real human being. Hold on. Hold on. That's two beings, James. James, James, James. That's two beings. You have the one being, that's the Trinity, and now you have Jesus as a human being. And you emphasize that you can say that God is one because he's one being. Do you see how you're contradicting yourself? If Jesus is a real human being, that's two beings. And this is why many other Trinitarian scholars throughout the ages have said that, no, Jesus is not really a human being. Let's not kid ourselves. If Jesus is God taking on human flesh, and you'll see later on, James is going to make these kinds of statements that he's really just God walking around in a body. But this is a mistake. James, you've got to redo this because if you're going to start to tell people that Jesus is a real human being, you're contradicting yourself because you said the Trinity is one God because he's only one being. Now you've got two beings. 
On page 58, let me follow up on that idea a little bit. I'm quoting James where he says, The eternal logos, fully deity by nature, eternal creator, the very source of life itself, became a human being. This is the only way to understand his words, unquote. Well, if that's the only way to understand his words, this could be understood to mean that God is no longer God. If the creator, the very source of life itself, became a human being, that would mean he's not God anymore. If we're going to interpret the word became as what we normally use it for, as a change. If he became a human being, he changed, he's no longer God if he became a human being. And then James makes some comments about this word, which is translated in different ways, sometimes as only begotten or unique son, in John 1.14, and the word also occurs in verse 18. There's been a change in the Trinitarian understanding of this word, whereas in previous times people preferred more the idea of the only begotten son of God. There's been somewhat of a shift away from that idea because if somebody is begotten, begotten is just simply a fancy word for being born. And I think they use the word begotten to kind of shroud it in mystery a bit, keeping the old King James language. But it simply means he was born. But the problem for the Trinitarian world then is if you're born, it means you have a beginning. So then they have to go and say, well, this is a, an eternal generation. They realize there's a problem with saying that there's an eternal generation of a son from the father. And I actually agree with the other interpretation of this word, monogenes, which can be broken down to mean one of a kind. He's a unique one of a kind. Because we see there are many others who are born of God. In John chapter 1, verse 13, there are others that are born of God. So the word here, I think, is paralleling the relationship of Isaac to Abraham. Isaac was Abraham's unique son, son of promise, born uniquely, all these kinds of things. He was a unique son. Jesus is our brother, just like he said. He's not our God. He's our brother. He's a unique son. He's the only one who's at the right hand of God. So I agree with James that this shouldn't be interpreted only begotten. But then James jumps to John 1.18 and there's a Greek textual variant in John 1.18. You can see this, again, reflected in the English translations. Like the ESV says, no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Compare that with the King James. No man has seen God any time. The only begotten Son. See, that's the phrase that there's a variant where the ESV had the only God, the King James says the only begotten son. So you have this word, the unique one, or some think it is the only begotten. And then the question is, is it God or is it son? Is it a unique or begotten son or is it a unique or begotten God? So there's big disagreements on how to interpret John 1.18. But then James White gives his preferred translations. He says, quote, if we wanted something a little more literal, I would suggest the only son who is God, unquote. Now, James, come on, hold on a second. It's either son or it's God in this text. You can't have both the son and God. The variant is on son and God. You can't stick them both in there. That's just not being fair. It's either son or it's God. It's either the unique son or the unique God. You can choose whichever one you want. But some of these translations, they really don't make much sense because look at ESV. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side. Wait a second. The one at the Father's side is the only God? That translation would mean one of two things. Either the Father is not God, since the, quote, only God is at the Father's side, or if there is only one God at the Father's side, aren't we forgetting someone else? Where's the other God person, the Spirit? If the Spirit and the Son are one being with the Father, 
Is only the Son at the Father's side? Shouldn't there be another God person at the Father's side? In fact, throughout this chapter, it seems like James White has forgotten about the third person of the triune God. And let's back up just a second to the first phrase in John 1.18. No man has seen God at any time. Doesn't the Trinitarian and deity of Christ interpretation of John chapter 1 totally contradict that statement in John 1.18 that no one has ever seen God? No one has ever seen God. Let's believe the writer of the Gospel of John. Thousands of people saw Jesus Christ, but no one has ever seen God. And James does briefly respond to the claim that no one has ever seen God at any time. Page 60, when John says no one has seen God at any time, he is referring to the Father. No one has seen the Father at any time. Okay, really? And then he goes on and he actually changes his translation because then he says, the unique one has made the Father known. Uh, okay, unique one is very different from the only Son who is God. So he himself flipped his translation of Manoganes there, of the unique one. It's just not a very good explanation. He sees that no one has ever seen God. Now, why would that be the Father in James White's view? Isn't God the Trinity? Aren't we supposed to be showing the best verses, the best scriptures, where God is a trinity? And he doesn't give any explanation why, quote, God the Son can be seen before he was incarnated, after he was incarnated, and still be God. If Jesus is, quote, God the Son, then why? Why can he be seen and not the Father? But again, these translations are really, really struggling. Okay, so the New American Standard says no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten God. Hmm. All right, so now we have a God who is begotten. He's born. Interesting. That leads me to a kind of overall assessment of James White's Trinitarian appeal to John 1 as evidence that the God of the Bible is a trinity. My assessment is that the effort failed. It's very unconvincing. The language and concepts commonly associated with Trinitarianism are not found at all in John 1. For instance, there's no mention in John 1 of a supposed third person who is also God. Even the proposed second God person, the Logos, the Word, is in various ways presented in John 1 as someone who is subordinate to God, the Father. It is stated twice in John's first two verses that the Logos was with God. Second, the things that came to be in John 1 came to be through the Word. That is, the Word is not the origin of whatever came to be, but is only an instrumental channel or partner. Next, depending on the interpretation of the Greek word monogenes as either one of a kind or only begotten in John 1.14 and 1.18, if the word was at some point begotten, that means he was born. He had a beginning and an origin from outside of himself. Also, the word was seen by humans while the other member or members of the deity can't be seen. It's understandable why the Logos theorists of the 2nd through the 4th centuries believe that Jesus was a second lesser God, as their view aligns more easily with John 1 than the Trinitarian view. Of course, I don't believe either of those views is correct, since I believe John 1 is not a commentary on the Genesis creation but is introducing the new beginning that God brings about through the human Christ Jesus. And finally, if we look back on James White's definition of what the Trinity is on page 23 in his book, an objective reader should ask why James brings John 1 to the table as his first and foremost evidence of the triune God. 
James White's exposition of John 1 doesn't line up with his definition of the Trinity. Nowhere in John 1 is there a description of within the one being are three divine persons. The Holy Spirit is not mentioned at all. We only find two persons in John 1 who are potentially God. But James White contradicted his own definition of the Trinity and declared that one of the two persons is a human being. That would mean the Trinity is not one being. We do not find in John 1 any description of three persons who are within one being and who are co-eternal and co-equal. The word co-equal does not appear in John 1. The word co-eternal does not appear in John 1. These words appear in James White's definition of the Trinity. James White's exposition of John 1 does not support his own definition of what the Trinity is. I suppose maybe in the sense of confirmation bias, a Trinitarian could think that John 1 is evidence that God is triune. One might think he can find a clue here or a clue there to fit the theory, while ignoring so much else, including the fact that there's nothing about a triune God in the passage. The Trinity has to be assembled from another place. If you've got to assemble your God, perhaps your God is an idol. In the next podcast, I hope to take yet another look at John chapter 1, the chapter that keeps on giving. I hope to give some suggestions on how we can interpret John chapter 1 and explain John chapter 1 to our Trinitarian friends and to non-believers that perhaps they can grasp this masterpiece of a chapter which says that God is bringing about the new creation through his word, the man Jesus Christ. And that new creation is the hope of resurrection from the dead. Yishma'u anavim v'yismachu. The humble will hear and rejoice.